Hello, Dr. Nicholas. Thank you for jumping on the Crypto Kid podcast. So what's your background and how did you get into cryptocurrency? Um, hi, and thanks for having me. Mm-hmm. I was actually involved in the space before even the invention of Bitcoin. And that was actually due to my research interests at the university. So I'm a computer scientist. I did my PhD and postdoc at Stanford University. And my interests are in distributed systems, which is essentially what the blockchain is. The precursor to blockchain existed many years before. And social computing, which is related to human computer interaction and crowdsourcing. So uh, as part of my master's thesis, I created a framework for writing smart contracts on fault tolerant distributed systems. Uh, And of course, back then it wasn't called smart contracts and it wasn't called the blockchain, but it was similar concepts. Um, And then as part of my postdoc, I introduced and taught uh, a class at Stanford University uh, at the computer science department there, uh, the CS 359B, which was teaching students how to design decentralized applications on blockchain. And now in this class, students created... uh, and deployed uh, multiple functional working prototypes of decentralized applications, but they all got stuck in having people to use them. Uh, And that's mostly because many reasons, uh, but uh, user experience related reasons on blockchain back then. But um, one core uh, blocking point was that before anyone can use any of those apps, they needed to acquire cryptocurrency to pay for the gas fees. now, at Stanford is also where I got to meet my other uh, founder uh, of Pi, uh, Chen Yao Fan, where she also did her PhD there as well. And it's like our academic career and personal interests that uh, is what truly led to uh, create the Pi Network, which we founded uh, at the end of 2018. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And hey, I got a chance to watch a lecture of yours on YouTube, you explaining how blockchain technology works. There's just so much to learn about it. I mean, I really appreciate you taking on that challenge in in, um, developing young minds to get involved with the future, especially something that has to do with money, governance, and law later on down. Yeah, thanks for saying this. I I really try, when I try to explain something, I try to uh, look at what what is the audience. So when I am uh, uh, teaching to CS students, the audience is more technical, but when I'm trying to uh, explain something that is for the general uh, population, I'm trying to start from really ground zero. <laughs> Keep pushing, man. You're doing a great job. Now, we're going to talk about Pi Network. And what is unique about Pi Network compared to other blockchains coming out and other cryptocurrencies? What makes you you guys different? Yeah, so so Pi Network is essentially a massive open community with over 35 million engaged members. And this community is powered by Pi, which is the world's most widely distributed cryptocurrency. So this platform that we're putting together is essentially creating a, a robust, especially accessible ecosystem for three types of people, for users, for developers who are building apps and for merchants who are using apps. And uh, what makes it different? Um, I would say that uh, uh, we follow the number of uh, uh, non-consensus strategies compared to other cryptocurrencies. Uh, Like for example, we didn't uh, just focus on solving a technical problem. Sometimes you hear things like, Uh, transactions per second and this and that technical uh, solutions. Uh, But we also focused on uh, solving the human problems. So having people engaged, having people on the platform to begin with. Uh, Another thing that we did differently is that uh, uh, we, we don't, our platform is not just focusing on blockchain native applications and nothing else meaning like DeFi, NFT, of course, these are possible on Pi, but this is the, not the only thing that the platform is focuses. It focuses on all types of applications that uh, that, that solve needs uh, for mainstream audience. Um, let me see. Uh, another another different, different thing that we did slightly different here is that uh, we focused on accessibility and ex- inclusivity 
through essentially trying to reduce any kind of barriers for, for people to participate, such as financial barriers and technical barriers. So financially, we don't ask them to pay for anything to acquire Pi. In fact, it's not even possible for someone to, to do that. You can only mine it uh, on the platform. And technical barriers, they don't need to be computer scientists or uh, have uh, complicated uh, mining rigs at home that uh, like, that are uh, allowing them to mine. All they need is a mobile phone and uh, and uh, participate use, using. Amazing. Yeah, there's like so many mining farms out there. And it's crazy how much it, it can damage the ecosystem, in my opinion. And we we definitely need more room for improvement and protecting the environment. And that's a great way. And plus you have a, you have literally have a computer in, in the palm of your hand. So, and more and more people, the phone is so easy to use. A kid could navigate it. So that's just, you're going to get like 10 year olds learning how to mine cryptocurrencies and then met them making more money than their parents. It's amazing. So what is, what will the KS or KYC solutions help the pioneers? How will it help the pioneers? Ha! Huh, so how will it help? And uh, I, um, first of all, uh, Pi is a from the beginning we're building it as a fully compliant uh, platform. Uh, we are we're here. We are uh, uh, our identities are known mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Uh, we wanted it to, as part of compliance, uh, these services, these uh, networks uh, need to uh, do something called KYC. So KYC is Know Your Customer, stands for um, Know Your Customer, and it was initially used in traditional businesses. So in this case, uh, in a blockchain, the word customer doesn't make a lot of sense, but uh, I guess we're going with it. Uh, so the need for KYC is for compliance purposes, um, and but also for um, the ability to uh, have a more valuable ecosystem. So if you remember from uh, the maybe what is it now, 10, 20 years ago when social networks started existing, there was a bunch of social networks before Facebook that were uh, all composed of fake users and fake accounts and every cat and dog had their own uh, uh, profile on the on the social network. And then Facebook came along and it was the first one that was saying, no, we want real users. We want real uh, people, real faces, real names. That was unheard of on the internet before that uh, because everybody was still afraid of putting the real name on the internet. Uh, and, and yet what happened is that it changed, it shifted the whole world's uh, uh, mentality and uh, people started using the internet for a lot more useful uh, purposes. In the same thing now with blockchain, the first generation was, uh, oh, let's use it for anonymity, but that didn't work out very well and it doesn't pr produce as useful utility as it uh, would have. And... Uh, uh, now the second generation is uh, the one that is uh, um, based on real identity. And actually, this is how you can, uh, you're able to create uh, true uh, useful applications on top of uh, blockchains. Now, Pi created its own KYC solution. I'm happy to <laughs> tell you about it as well. But Yeah, I remember when Facebook, when Facebook was out and the way that they would um, weed out the uh, fake users is you had to message like 10 people to make sure that you're actually ruined. It was just like such a process and it was kind of annoying. I was just, I didn't like it, but when Facebook came out, it was just so much easier and actually better. So I think blockchain is, will be better in the future. And as more people get involved with it and start understanding the technology, you'll see a lot more use cases in it. And what was I going to say? Yeah, that's pretty much it. And so why was accessibility an important factor for developing Pi Network? Well, um, accessibility is very important. Um, any successful currency that wants to support a real ecosystem with utilities relies on a large social network because uh, uh, in order for you to have uh, 
true utility, you need to have many people recognize uh, the, the cryptocurrency and uh, are able to uh, own it and uh, they are willing to transact goods and services with that currency. Uh, so the size of a crypto network uh, essentially needs to hit an inflection point for real utilities and markets to form. Uh, and that's the, the, that. after this inflection point, we will be able to have network effects. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just remembered what I was going to say earlier. Blockchain technology, back to that, blockchain technology is like the internet in the 90s. Yeah. So that's what I just wanted to say. And you also made a great point with the accessibility. And what does this mean for the future of mining on mobile phones? So I think that uh, you the use it in order for you to have a useful um, cryptocurrency, uh, you, you can't think uh, 2009. So uh, Bitcoin was uh, great because it uh, proved to the world that cryptocurrencies exist and uh, it is possible to have a decentralized ledger that is maintaining the an accurate uh, the essentially accurately maintains the balances of different people uh, because before that you would need a, a centralized bank to tell you what your true balance is and with bitcoin we we the proof of concept of a decentralized bank essentially uh, is possible uh, but um, uh, that was 2009 and people were using computers and it was a little slow and it had a, it's consuming a lot of energy as we all say and it, it's block takes 10 minutes but um in to, today you know if you want to have a, a cryptocurrency that is functional and useful to everyday people it needs to be on mobile mm -hmm. <laughs> it needs to be more uh, um, faster and more accessible so to answer your question, I think that uh, it is the future. Uh, mobile, it has to be mobile. Mm -hmm. Just like just like the metaverse, everybody is pretty yeah. soon. You do you teach class from home? I uh, uh, my primary job is uh, building Pi Network, but it just happens that uh, every year uh, since I left uh, Stanford, I have 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 been invited to uh, co-instruct uh, one of the blockchain classes over at Stanford. It's not official, but it just every year they, it just happens that they invite me again. <laughs> so I teach the technical lectures in that class and uh, other um, uh, instructors teach uh, non-technical uh, aspects. Okay. Okay. I like it. I like it. Now, what are the stages of verification? I know sometimes it can be a little bit complex with the authenticator and it can it can be kind of tedious to some people. So the stages of authentication, can you um, maybe help me understand your question a little more? Like, the, the, like um, the, how do how to access the the cryptocurrencies or the oh. coins? The, the Pi? Are you talking about yeah, the, Pi? Yeah, yeah <laughs> to like, I, um, how do I say to make sure the person that's actually accessing it is actually them, not in, and not some hacker from across the other side of the world? Uh, yeah, there are two questions here. I guess uh, one is about the user and one one is about uh, the consensus algorithm. I, I think you're more interested about the user. So um, the so Pi has two uh, levels. Mm -hmm. So first of all, for the past few years, people have been mining it through a mobile app. So on that mobile app, uh, they have been accumulating Pi as, uh, let's say, um, tokens. And uh, these are not the, the, these are the tokens that are going to be moved, migrated into the mainnet blockchain and has been migrating. We have actually already migrated over uh, two and a half something million people into the uh, minute blockchain. So for these two systems, there is essentially two different ways of authenticating yourself. So for the mobile app uh, system, we use a traditional uh, username, password, uh, or you can have uh, Facebook sign in and a few other Apple sign in and a few other uh, ways to, to authenticate yourself. Uh, now for the 
actual blockchain, which is what happens after your KYC and your balance is migrated from, from the app into the blockchain, for the actual blockchain, we use uh, um, non-custodial uh, wallets. That's a mouthful, but <laughs> for, the, for the audience who, uh, who may not know what this means, it means that uh, they, uh, the users will have to remember a passphrase and that passphrase is enough to fully authenticate themselves. And no one else knows that passphrase uh, to the point that uh, if someone were to hack it theoretically without stealing it from you using a virus, if they were to actually hack it and hack uh, SATO 56, it would take them 100 billion years to do, do it using computational uh, uh, methods. Of course, they can try to, steal, to, to deceive you, to give you, to give them your passphrase, which is a different uh, problem. It's a user experience problem, but uh, in terms of um, uh, cryptography, it's uh, very strong. So essentially, uh, like um, in the proper way uh, all cryptocurrencies are supposed to do it uh, is through um, uh, non-custodial wallets. So the users have to remember this passphrase. Now, because this passphrase is a little difficult to remember, we ask the users to save it on um, somewhere safe. And uh, we help them use the phone's uh, uh, biometric features, such as the thumbprint or the facial scan, mm -hmm. to essentially load up this uh, passphrase using their phone's uh, um, algorithms. And there are some phones, some depending on uh, uh, companies, I guess uh, you can tell that uh, uh, these days uh, most phones are doing a pretty good job at uh, securing those, uh, those data. The simplicity of it is very important, and I, I hope this encourages people to jump into it and not be afraid of of memorizing a phrase. Just just get into it. It's not that hard, and the more you the more you um, learn about it, the easier it'll become. So the, the good thing about the pie, I, if you want me to add this, is that. Mm -hmm. uh, this the whole ecosystem is built around the program we call the Pi browser. So it's like a web browser, but for Pi applications, and you can access the ecosystem there. And one of the applications of this uh, Pi browser is the Pi wallet. So essentially, we have created a system where um, the various Pi apps can talk to each other and the Pi wallet, and uh, they are able they are able to interconnect. So let's say you are on a gaming app and you want to spend a few tokens to uh, continue where you left off. So you you say, I want to do it. You push a button, then it pulls the Pi wallet in front of you. Then you touch your thumb. Uh, it asks you if you are sure that you want to submit this amount of uh, Pi to that uh, specific app. Uh, you say yes or no, and then Pi is transmitted to the app and you are directed back to the set to where you were. And this whole thing connects uh, together, making it uh, as seamless, seamless as possible for the end user. So, the, so even though these concepts, cryptocurrencies and uh, blockchain and all these things are very, sometimes could be very complicated for um, non-technical audience, we're trying to make it as simple as possible. Now, would that be the trust graph of uh, working with the ecosystem? Now, the trust graph is something core to our uh, consensus algorithm. So uh, it's the, um, the, the way that uh, Pi works is um, it essentially creates a trust graph of people who are considered to be on the mainnet in a way. And... Uh, if you the, the the there is a mathematical proof in the in the paper that is explaining this, which is about twenty pages long. Uh, but uh, if you, if you're trying to think of it very very intuitively, uh, if the Pi network was just it wasn't the thirty five million people plus we have, but it was just me, you, and a couple of your friends. And the, they, the way it works at Pi is that we get to select three to five people we know and trust, literally from our uh, contact list. And uh, this is for us, our security circle. And this, this, the combination of all the security circles creates the trust graph. 
So if in the in the network it was me pointing at you and your and two other people and you were pointing at me and some of them and they were pointing at you and uh, and we were pointing at each other. Uh, essentially, if someone were to come and create one thousand fake accounts, then those fake accounts wouldn't be able to affect the decisions that we make or the, where we uh, we allocate our trust, because in order for them to to modify anything in, in in our decisions, they would need to convince us to stop pointing at each other and start, start pointing at them. Okay, okay. Now, you have a robust um, active member users, and that's it's 35 million plus, and that's pretty impressive, I would say. How how did you how did you get that many people involved in into the Pi network in itself, just, I can't wrap my mind around it. It's amazing. Yeah, so uh, it's about being clear on the value propositions and uh, trying to create a true utility, um, trying to provide a safe and fair ecosystem for everyone. So, so essentially, it's about being simple to use, simple to develop, accessible basically no financial or technical barriers to begin and uh, creating network effects all right all right now what is your target audience for pi network right that's a very good question so i i think that in order for us to create anything that is uh, that achieves mass adoption. And I think that's what the blockchain industry needs as a whole. And uh, we are we are all would like to collaborate on this. Uh, in order for the blockchain industry to achieve mass adoption, we shouldn't be only focusing on a s- one small audience, like one specific segment. Um, we should focus on uh, everyday people. Um, it's it's good and it's easy to get excited a small group of tech enthusiasts or crypto people and of course it's necessary to begin from somewhere we can begin from there but we need to create interfaces that are uh, accessible by everyone so I would say you know everyone even okay. uh, uh, our parents and uh, our kids and <laughs> Believe me, I've been trying. I've been trying. And my mom and dad just, they think I'm crazy. <laughs> they really do. They're just like, go get a job, start working, which I do. I do. But I'm just like, but this is the future, mom and dad. You should get into it, especially while it's cheap. And it's just, they they can't wrap their mind around it. They're just... Um, you send them a pie invitation code and uh, do the experiment to tell to tell us if they will manage to do it. <laughs> oh, I definitely will send it over, and that challenge is on. All right. <laughs> so, does the bear market clean out the landscape? Landscape, I mean. That that's right. Yes. So, in the crypto space, there is a lot of uh, noises. And also there is a lot of um, uh, projects maybe that are in for the wrong reasons, maybe trying to have some uh, quick uh, um, effects uh, without uh, paying attention to long-term value. So it's usually the case that uh, long-term valuable projects are usually started or uh, um, basically persevered during uh, low times. yeah, because uh, a, anything that gets very quick uh, results uh, can also very quickly decay. So we we saw some of that in the in the previous months or the beginning of uh, of this uh, uh, period. I agree. I agree, and. It just shows who the real enthusiasts are. Also, I personally like the bear market. It's it's just something I like talking more about it when times are bad, just because I know when times are good, people are just going to be like, hey, you know, well, you know what, Sonny or Crypto Kid, you were right. Or doctor, you were right, you know, at school or something like or your peers or somebody that you were trying to convince. So or persuade. You know, 
I, I, there's something I like to, uh, it's about going to conferences. So when the crypto space is very hot, then you go to conferences and there's so many people there and the, the com- types of conversations sometimes you're having are very shallow. But when uh, times are a little more uh, smaller, uh, then uh, you tend to meet and discuss and have uh, a lot more challenging conversations. <laughs> Exactly. And you have to have the answers for them. And sometimes, sometimes you don't because you're just, you're continuously learning about and going into rabbit holes with blockchain technology. And there's just so many use cases like for identity, health care, and so much more. Um, what is it? The supply chain too. Hmm. So when is the net mainnet dropping for Pi Network? Well, Technically, we are already on mainnet. So we launched it uh, officially back in December of 2021. Um, but uh, Pi has uh, done one other thing that is non-consensus. You, well, you asked me about this question earlier, and, and there's so many non-consensus things. Is we created the concept of uh, enclosed mainnet and uh, uh, open mainnet. So we're currently on the enclosed mainnet, which means that the real blockchain is out there. We are in the process of uh, performing KYC on the members and migrating the, their balances essentially over to the enclosed mainnet. During the enclosed mainnet period, it is not allowed uh, to connect the Pi blockchain with any other blockchain or external systems. Um, and during this period, it, it gives us time to do a few things, such as migrating all the members, as I said, over to the mainnet, uh, continue building uh, utility for the platform. Uh, it allows us to have more uh, developers test their, um, their their applications and uh, uh, being able to do all that without the um, any uh, external noises or uh, uh, distractions, essentially. And uh, this is, it's an example, like for example, our, the KYC solution we created was one of the Pi applications that we built on top of uh, our own platform. And uh, in order for someone to KYC themselves, they need to pay one Pi. And that one Pi is then distributed to everyone who is uh, uh, helping with their, their KYC. So there is, uh, there is both uh, uh, AI algorithms as with every KYC solution, but when the AI algorithm need help from humans, uh, then uh, these humans are coming from the same network. So it's self-bootstrapping itself. And uh, uh, that's uh, happening even during the enclosed period. Um, yeah, so we are technically, the answer is that we are technically on mainnet already. It's called enclosed mainnet. And uh, at some point, we are going to move to the open network. 